There's a whole group of us living in the Caribbean, trying to create a, an alternative culture. Three Mile Island happened, so we came back. We got back to the States and we immediately heard about the Black Hills Women's Survival Gathering. The Lakota Nation had called it. And the women were calling for a gathering before the larger Lakota gathering. So we went to that and um, it was Punk Mary, Kendra, myself, Ruthie. We got blown away <laughs> as to what was happening with the Three Mile Island reality and the uranium mining and the Lakota prophecy starting to come true when the white men take the black stone from the mountains and the water becomes um, polluted and that's the beginning of the end for pe the people going from the earth upwards into the sky. We were all totally, totally, totally blown away. And um, I had been an organizer before that. I did welfare rights organizing in the Appalachians in the 60s and I um, was I started a halfway house for women coming coming out of psychiatric ward in the Caribbean. I started 24-hour crisis intervention service. I, I was an old-time uh, organizer even at that point. And what everything that we heard just blew me away so much that I had heard about this place called Michigan and we're, we're back on the road and I say to, to, I think it was Mary Gemini, I said, let's go to that place and get women energy. And <laughs> I said, well, where is it? I said, this is in Michigan somewhere. Why don't we just call and, and see if we can go there? And um, so we stopped at a truck stop. We made a call. She came back to the table and said, oh, they said no. And I said, oh, no, no, no. They don't realize it's not a matter of yes or no. We have to go. We will go. We need to have the kind of healing energy. So I called and I said, we have to go. We are coming and that's it. So we arrived on the land. There were only like eight other women on the land. This is the old land. And that was the beginning of my involvement and the other women's involvement in music festivals. And... Um, so, you know, it's, that's way too many stories and way too long a time, but through the women's music festivals, we created amazing circles. And uh, Michigan at that time was truly a revolutionary um, movement. And it was all about community, it was all about sisterhood, it was all about listening uh, to who we were, challenging our fears, not abiding by what we've been told could or could not happen as women, etc., etc., etc. And in 1982, when um, a group of women from the War Resisters League and the Friends, um, the Friends, the Friends Society, the Quaker mm -hmm. groups out of uh, Philadelphia. People were starting to call for a um, show of solidarity to, for, with the women of Greenham Common in England. And some Greenham women had come over to the States trying to do some fundraising and the peace organizations decided that we needed to do something in solidarity and help them out. But we didn't want to do a one day action you know, we had done the Wall Street stuff and uh, a lot of other kinds of, of uh, civil disobedience and things. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to do something that was more lasting and we wanted to do something that didn't necessarily um, evaporate after a one-shot deal in an urban setting. And so what we figured we should do is to look around and um, see where these Pershing and cruise missiles actually originated from. And of course, it's in rural parts of the country. It's always in rural parts of the country. And it's always, well, not always, but most often on native sacred lands that the military had gone ahead and, and gotten, um, you know, their military bases on. Which we don't think was any real coincidence. <laughs> 
and uh, so we used to have meetings in Albany and in New York and in Philadelphia etc and we always operated through consensus and I believe that the Quakers um, the Quaker groups brought the consensus into that whole process we had always used consensus at the the music festivals so we kind of combined the traditional Quaker sense of consensus along with our lesbian radicals oftentimes separatist <laughs> sense of consensus and um, so everybody was looking uh, they looked at I think it's Griffin Griffiths Griffiths the Air Force mm -hmm. Base in upstate and um, looked all around that area as to what was being done where you know the Seneca Army Depot the Air Force Base um, the uh, naval thing up there in the in Lake Geneva I mean it was just ripe for it exposing how much the military had actually um, taken and employed enough of the local uh, people to pretty much run the place. I mean nobody questioned, you know, nobody ever had any kind of, of protest ever. And so it was myself a woman from Nuclear Times, the magazine, mm -hmm. and I want to say it was possibly Karen Beadle. And um, there was a piece of land in near Romulus in Varick that had been abandoned. Well, not abandoned, but it 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 was. Uh, there was no one living there when we saw it. An older woman, I think, lived well into her nineties. It was her place, mm -hmm. and when she died, she left it to her niece. grand niece. So, the three of us just went over there, and it was a Sunday, and it was muddy. I think it was in March. It was really, really muddy, <laughs> and we, uh, you know, in the car, well, what are we going to say? Who, who are we going to tell? You know, we don't want to like, like exactly say we're going up against the military <laughs> establishment. We want your land because it butts up against the base, but then we don't want to lie. So. Um, <laughs> We went in, and uh, I remember like being really concerned. She has a very beautiful house. I was really concerned about the mud being on her, her, or her carpet. And it was a Sunday, and somebody had given me a name of a, a pastor in in the church that she attended, and that was our entree into her house. I had mentioned his name and that we wanted to do, um, I don't think I called it social change, I think I called it educational work for peace. And so she invited us in, she gave us tea and cookies and what kind of peace do you want? Well, world peace and um, you know, we, we don't want wars and we want to educate people as to um, how wars are perpetuated and how we have to live through the spirit you know I mean we really like you know stretched it kind of stuff but everything actually it was all true it was all you know elements of truth so lo and behold we'd like to buy this land from you and um, how much does it cost and I believe I believe that the price of the land was fifty six thousand dollars Either thirty six or fifty six. Thirty six. It was thirty six. Okay, thirty six thousand dollars. We had between us maybe you know twenty dollars, <laughs> right? And it's like oh thirty six. That is no problem. <laughs> How much do you need for a down payment? And we figured out that it was going to be three thousand dollars. I think was a down payment, for ten percent, right? Three thousand six hundred. And um, we went back and we started doing the networking with all the collaborative groups. We came up with the down payment. We didn't know how we were actually going to meet the mortgage payments. All these people, you know, well, here are the lawyers out of Boston. They're going to work up how to do a corporation so no individual is going to be held responsible. And, uh, you know, yes, here's like the War Resisters League, and there's also a group in Syracuse, 
that did the calendars. Syracuse Peace Council. Peace, Peace Council. Council. When, do and you Women's International. When Wilf, yeah, Freedom. when did Wilf come in? The War Resisters League? Will, or well, the women, no, women in the, in the League for Peace. Yeah, they were there from the beginning. From the beginning. Yeah, they were. And Mandy Carter was connected up. Man, uh, okay, I just saw Mandy on TV recently. Really? Yeah. What did it, uh, anyhow. Um, yeah. So everybody, all these organizations kept throwing, you know, their fun, their resources and their skills in terms of fundraising and their, the email didn't exist, but their mailing lists and all of that kind of stuff and everything we needed we got. And along the way we paralleled with our process, creating the process, consensus, um, male children, uh, male involvement, uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, you know, so we we're doing a parallel of logistics and a parallel of, of philosophy and policy kind of stuff, and um, we got the land, which was really impressive because, I mean, <laughs> because we had no money and we just—it was very magical. But that area, the country, had been settled a lot by the Amish families, and it was 56 acres. Right? 56, 4, 56, or something. Or something. 53.2, I think. And they, they, that's exactly the, the size that a, a son would get from a family if he was second or third and fourth in line. Because the uh. eldest would inherit the fathers. The eldest oh. would take care of the father and the mother. But the second, third, fourth would have to get their own. So that was the exact amount, because we had an Amish family next to it. And then on the other side we had the um, trailer park. And so we were very lucky to get that, because later on we were, we'd met a lot of farmers who had been trying to get that, who were not Amish as well. And lo and behold, I get there and there's Jody. <laughs> I said, Jody, I thought I got the job. <laughs> so I said, I guess we're going to split the job. <laughs> we'll co-job it. So that's how Jody and I became the first and only staff people. And then um, it was, I mean, the house is completely empty. We had nothing. But it was May, I remember. And the college students were leaving Genesee. And we had a, a call from a woman, um, God, you know, I can't remember her first name now. Later it was Samoa. But oh, Kim. Kim. Kim, Kim. okay, so got a mm -hmm. call from Kim who was running some some center connected up to the, the college or university. And so Jody and I rode over there and she said, oh, we have furniture, man. You know, so we loaded up this stuff. It was like a couch with three legs, you know. <laughs> so, so, we furnished the, the house with pretty funky stuff, right? And I remember seeing Kim. She was huge. She was, must have been six like six-something. And <laughs> she was really, you know, big. And she had a ponytail pulled back <laughs> and one of those uh, football jerseys <laughs> and a skirt. She had a skirt on. So she didn't know what Jody and I were all about. And we didn't really <laughs> care too much what she was about. We just needed furniture. We had nothing. So, but... Um, I mean, what's really interesting, you know, you were talking earlier, Estelle, about how the encampment touched lives, changed lives. To track this woman's life was would be a radically, um, you know, visual journey. Uh -huh. Because the last time I remember Kim, or Samoa, seeing her, I think she was either eating fire while in the glass <laughs> in, the, in the back. Yeah, it was quite a leap. <clears throat> but then, um, you know, we started uh, doing everything you needed to do to get ready to be an encampment without letting anybody know that we we're going to be an encampment. And so we were actually starting to implement the logistical part of it while the philosophical policy parts of it were still being um, crafted. We were part of that as well in terms of the meetings. Once we had the land, the meetings started to happen on the land. And, uh, you know, we had to decide how far back men would be able to go and 
uh, all of the things in terms of access and you know how old is too old for male babies. I remember that meeting. That actually took place in Albany. And there was Kate Donnelly, I think it was mm -hmm. Kate Donnelly, mm -hmm. who, who made the buttons, and she had a little baby boy, and there was a woman there, I forget who it was, that had a little baby girl, and I mean babies, they must have, they're toddlers, and we're having this big debate, no, it's not inherent within a male gender to be violent, no, it's environment, no, if you're raised by loving people, <laughs> and I'm looking at the two babies, and this little baby boy picks up this thing and hits the little baby girl in the head, <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> well, all right. So, yeah. But those meetings went on forever. All right. Um, so back to, to the house. And we're learning a little more about the older woman that lived there. Like she lived there alone. And she, um, it was, she seemed to be an amazing person. I wish that I had known her. And um, we found this little dugout area. It wasn't the root cellar. It was under the living room. And we were wondering if that house hadn't been a part of the Underground Railroad, you know, and that was the hiding place. I, somehow, I feel like that truly was the part. Uh -huh. And we started uh, getting all of the data in from people doing the research in terms of the military presence and what that meant w within the um, area and that that county had the highest uh, rate of cancer and that, you know, the Manhattan Project um, tailings had been dumped mm -hmm. in the uh, Seneca Army Depot and that um, the sightings of white everything in there was pretty common, you know, white deer, white fox, Rocks. white skunk, white everything, right? And so we started trying to, like, figure out um, how to put all of that together to do outreach educational things because it wasn't just the presence uh, of us as anti-deployment to the base. It was also educational stuff to the community and how we could talk about conversion of that area into a place that was much more of a healthy lifestyle for the local people and not to be so dependent on the government. Well, we had to go through many, many steps in terms of, of getting permits to have people there. And we were going out to meetings with county and meetings with all kinds of officials. Um, I remember we had to set up a huge town meeting that was held at the fire station. And because people are wondering, well, who are those strange women at so-and-so's house? You know, what are they doing? Some kind of what? Some kind of hippie peace thing? Why? <laughs> and we would get like, uh, you know, uh, a farmer coming by and saying, look, you know, I got 40 bales of hay and you, you girls are going to need to put the hay in the back there because that the drainage thing is and <laughs> on and on. We're there, oh, okay. And we're trying to draw up plans. I remember creating an office in the house, again, with no furniture. So we went to the barn and we found um, where the chickens used to um, be and underneath there was this really long plank so we took that out and <laughs> scraped the chicken shit off as best we could and we put that, that became our desk in the office but you know never really got all of the chicken crap off of that so that was, that was an ongoing joke between uh, Jody and I. And Jody you know is a great logistical person I mean you could say Jody you know we need this built and she'd have three pieces of material and sooner or later you'd have that. But in terms of her social skills at that time, <laughs> it left a bit to be desired. So when we would go into meetings, I pretty much became, you know, the, uh, the mouth. <laughs> uh, so, and, um, and I, you know, I, I used to do um, a lot of stand-up comedy kinds of stuff, so I always have used comedy for a tension um, relaxer or just an outright break the hostility um, kind of <laughs> play. Whatever the case may be. And so we would go into these meetings at Derrick and the little town town meetings in Romulus, and um, you know, more times than not, we were doing pretty okay, and they were laughing. And, as soon as people laugh, the threat is is diminished. So we're doing pretty okay in terms of getting our permits and uh, 
you know, getting acceptance and stuff. And more people were coming around from the community and two women came and said, well, we have a tractor we can bring over and that kind of thing. And the town hall meeting was coming up. So before you tell us about the town hall, how many women would you say at this point were a part of like these meetings or kind of core organizing or making these decisions about logistics and blah, blah? Well, it depended on where, if the meetings were being held in Albany or New York or Philly, I mean, it was much more. If they're being held at the encampment, maybe 15, okay. 12, 15. Because okay. um, it was far, you know, as you know. It's, yeah, uh, it's, it's a bit out there. <laughs> it's a bit yeah. out there. And that's what the military liked, and yeah. that's what we were searching for. And we didn't have much water stuff going on, and the rats there were pretty bad. And um, on one of our trips, Jody had, I think it was coming back from Michigan, we had stopped in Pennsylvania, and they had these um, rest stops that were kind of uh, environmentally friendly. So Jody thought we should try to go and build those. So she was working on that design, how to build those, and you know we were going to use the methane gas for like power, and uh -huh. we were coming up with everything. It was going like, to plant red clover and harvest that, and you know, that's going to be organic, and that was going to go to all the co-ops, and that's how we we're going to pay the taxes, and <laughs> <coughs> etc. So there we are at the uh, town hall meeting, and it was packed. I mean, there must have been two, three hundred people there for that area that meant every household came you know they wanted to know who we were and how come it was just gonna be women and and we were talking about well a, as women we traditionally have been put in roles where we you know were made to feel as though we couldn't do things on our own so this is a, a way and a chance for us to prove that we can. <laughs> We're really like, oh, God, I felt like I should have, you know, white lace dress on with <laughs> big hair. And um, there was this one guy, he was just adamant about women can't do it, just can't do it. <laughs> and what if something happens and there's no man there to protect you? What are you going to do? And I, I wish I had a camera on this. Because Samoa <laughs> slowly rises up from her chair. I mean, slowly. And she just kept going. And you could see everybody in the room just going. <laughs> and just kept going. And by the time she was up, and I'm sure she stood on her tippy toes because she was like even a little taller than she really truly was. She just said, I don't think it's going to be a problem. <laughs> and everybody just burst out laughing, Matt. And that was it for, you know, what are you going to do if a guy comes on? Yeah. So, <clears throat> and we were gaining a lot of momentum. It was gaining a lot, a lot of momentum out there. I don't know if it was all of the work that the different organizations were doing in, in their communities combined with the fact that we were in solidarity and support of Greenham and they were getting quite a bit of press because of the cruise missiles um, that were being documented but we started getting media calls um, from not only the US mainstream media but also um, the international press and so this, of course, was the time where we had no leadership. We, we will have no leadership. There will be no leaders. Everybody must take a part of the responsibility for everything. We will have no spokesperson for the media. Everybody's a spokesperson. So we did some really quick kind of bullet points as if you speak to the press, this is what you say in terms of what we want to get over, you know. I mean, you can express your opinion about anything, but what we want to get over are these bullet points in terms of the money and the, uh, the perpetuation of the, the war, um, you know, criminal <laughs> sensitivity of the military and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, so. And we talked a lot about lesbian visibility. Because traditionally, if you were to look at your social change movements, 
and look at the core of the workers, more often than not, a large proportion would be lesbian powered. And yet, <clears throat> as you would come from the organizing circles out to the, the mainstream to create that social change, lesbian visibility became almost nothing. So we were going to not allow that to happen. So we talked a long time and came up with, of course, we couldn't call it a rule because we would have no rules. We could, I think we came up with suggested policies, policies yeah. or suggested, yeah. The word suggested was in there, I remember. <laughs> <coughs> or guidelines, suggested guidelines, something. And um, what we wanted to make sure everybody knew was that you could be a spokesperson, and we rotated spokespeople by the day, but you could not say anything about lesbians. You couldn't say, I'm a lesbian, or I'm not a lesbian. You know, if somebody asked you directly about involvement, be honest, but, you know, there was no invisibility here, and what we wanted to create um, was all people would be seen on the same level. And so we were trying to take away that cop-out of um, I'm not a lesbian right, right. kind of thing. So, yeah, that was a policy. It took a long time, a lot of discussion. Um, and we were getting closer and closer to the opening date and more and more people were coming. Um, you know, it wasn't just Jody and I, in fact, I mean, for a long time, Jody and I had the, the luxury of having that whole house to herself, you know, and then people were coming and taking little spaces to sleep, so we had to do policies about where you could sleep and, you know, what's the common room, and then, of course, if women are living together, signage had to start going up about <laughs> cleanliness and your mom doesn't live here and you know you know who's doing the kitchen and what foods can come in and what can and jody said yeah i'm gonna go get a bus you know it's just like all this stuff everything had to be meeting about you know nobody could make a decision <laughs> I mean, later on, I remember, and I tell this oftentimes when I'm organizing or if I'm speaking someplace, I'll, I'll tell about the decision about the rats, <laughs> you know, like, and I hate rats. It's the only thing in my life that I'm deathly afraid of, and they were getting really big. And the, the whole thing that a whole group of women who didn't want to, like, poison rats yeah. um, went off to, to shower at the state park there. And those of us that just wanted to get rid of the rats quickly held a meeting, reached consensus to poison the rats. You know, so there were, like, certain ways that you would get around. That is the Bush administration. <laughs> That's yeah. like judge appointees now. Okay. Yeah, right. We've seen that. Right, right. <laughs> And we're, you know, playing around, well, we can't let some woman who's really not all that balanced be holding our process up here. So then we started consensus minus one, consensus minus two. <laughs> I think we invented that at the encampment. Okay. Yeah. I wonder. <laughs> and it took us a long time to reach a point to even broach that, you know what yeah. I mean? At, at Michigan, we tried to operate uh, with consensus whenever we could. However, because there was a large amount of money, mm -hmm. what we managed to do was separate, okay, your, your names are on the paper, so you're kind of like the bottom line when it comes to business. But we are the bottom line when it comes to policy. So we, we, we created the LUNTS you know, land union mm -hmm. negotiating team and the CUNTS, the coordinator union negotiating team. So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it was a really exciting that. time to yeah. just create different ways of solving things with that incorporated everybody's input. It was really very radical. So anyways, um, we're getting back. We're doing pretty okay with the community. And, you know, nothing had come out about being a bunch of radical lesbians. At, at the most, it had been hippies. Uh -huh. peace hippies mm -hmm. and you know and they're girls they're peace hippie girls <laughs> so it's like okay they're not really that dangerous kind of stuff let's drop them some food and we'll give them some hay and like that but then this guy oh what is his name i sometimes i remember his name and sometimes i don't the, the guy, with, guy yeah, what's, yeah we've got what his was name his name I don't know if it was in it, but yeah. Everett? Everett? Everett or Emmett? Everett. Everett. Yeah. Everett. Something like that, yeah, right? So yeah. he comes up and he says, 
Michelle, I, I want to give you all some American flags for, um, you know, the 4th of July. And I said, well, Everett, I knew his name at that time. I'll call him Everett. Everett, I really want to thank you for that offer, and I would gladly take that flag. But, you know, we operate through consensus here, and we have about 200 women on the land, so it would take us some time to get back to you about a decision. And this decision-making thing went on about the flag. It would go into, were you, oh, were I you there? Oh, I was there by then, yeah. It would go into like one, two, three in the morning. We made sure that, oh, about the um, um, suggested policy or suggested guidelines, you could not make that with just one meeting. There had to be a whole series, three times you had to have meetings and it had to be go out to uh, other women who were not on the land because we were constantly trying to maintain the network and the connection. And even though people's presence weren't there, it was really important for people to have a voice and a channel, not only for their financial um, support, but also what their beliefs were. So whatever we were doing around that kind of suggested stuff would have to go out. And this thing about the flag was so important that we had to go out and we were getting all kinds of input in. So it was very challenging in terms of how do you make a decision even when people weren't there. And so um, myself and some other women, we were very much advocating for the American flag to be accepted because I truly believed, and I'm a historian, I have a degree in film history and also I just love history, Historically speaking, the American flag is a sign of revolution in this country. And so I was advocating for that and, you know, it wasn't flying because more people were associating the American flag with, at that time, Central America and, you know, under the flag of oppression and all of that. So it was constantly, you know, going in the direction of no way are we going to make the American flag accept it. We're going to make our own flags on pillowcases. <laughs> Yeah, and then if you wanted an American flag, you could put the American flag on the pillowcase and you could put that on the front lawn. So that was a creative compromise. But I had to go back to this guy and say, you know, even though I really I am, collectively, we can't take your flag. So what he does is he goes out and <clears throat> thousands of these little flags were everywhere. He gives a flag to everybody in the surrounding three counties. And he starts to, like, you know, put it out into the media and to add the officials. These women must be communists because they won't take the American flag. Da 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 da. And then in the penny saver, a little thing shows up about these women are not only communists, they're lesbians. <laughs> Oh, lesbian communists are out there. Mood starts to change. <laughs> People aren't talking to us anymore in town. <laughs> Not so friendly when we have to get, you know, little permits. People are sneaking out from the base, cutting the water lines just the day before we're getting inspected for our, our camp permit. That would have been, when do we open? July, July 5th? 4th. No, we didn't do the 4th. Oh, we so. purposely didn't do the 4th. We didn't want to like it. July 5th, I think. July 5th. Yeah. Um. But we got our lines cut. You know, either the second or the mm -hmm. third. We're going to be the final inspection in order to become. Now we're a campground. Yeah, and okay. and we're all like, what do you mean? We have no water to let. <laughs> like, because they were sending people from the military base over at night and, and messing with our systems and, and things. In fact, one time, um, Jo this is before, this, this must have been in like May, um, we went to a meeting and we came back and there were these guys leaving our driveway wearing hard hats and lots of wires and they wouldn't stop. We tried to stop them to ask what they had been doing. And so at that point we are pretty sure that that's when we got totally bugged. And that and was when, do you have any idea? Yeah, that it was, was prior to the opening. Oh yeah, that was like there. in yeah. May. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Later on, when when we'd been there a while and people were coming forth and telling us that they had information for us, you know, we could never be sure 
what was being fed to us to to mess with us or were people really having um you know consciousness speak to them to let us know things but there was this one person and shag can talk to you about this one person because uh, she met up with him later on like not that long ago and he revealed to her, you know, how high-ranking he was in the military in terms of the intelligence. But um, we were told, you know, come take a walk with me, and we had to turn on radios, and he told us, you know, yeah, you've been, you know, since the beginning, you, you've been monitored, and um, told us, uh, even over in the trailer park, they had some people in the trailer park monitoring us. Oh, yeah. And to us, it was kind of like a joke. You know, we we tried to keep minutes of the meetings, and we oftentimes said, "Well, let's we'll get the government to give us a tape, so we'll know exactly <laughs> what you know, right. who said what when." Right. Um. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we're getting up there now. It's um, it's getting real close to the opening, and the phone is ringing off the hook, ringing off the hook. And this is when we got a sense that hey, this is going to be huge. You know, uh -huh. and we started hearing about the the walks that were coming in that the um, Buddhist monks and nuns and stuff uh -huh. were making. We had our policy in place. You know, men could only go into the living area where our educational brochures were. They could be on the um, front lawn, but they couldn't pass the back. And one of the things I'm most proud of is um, we would get literally tons of uh, phone calls from CBS, ABC, NBC, BBC, every magazine, Newsweek, Time, everything imaginable. Well, we're going to be sending a crew out there. I said, well, you better have it be a woman's crew. What are you talking about? Well, <laughs> if uh, you send a crew out here, they'll have very limited access to our space. If you send a woman's crew, they'll have the run of the place. They can talk to whoever, go wherever. But men are going to be restricted to an area. What do you mean? We don't have a woman's crew. Well, maybe it's time for you to get a woman's crew. And CBS especially. If you don't let us on, we will open our story with you didn't take the American flag. Ha! <laughs> um, well, okay then. And if you go into the archives, you'll find their story going down Route 96 and all these American flags, and then boom, no American flags, and this is the peace in Canada. They did. They were good for their word. That's what their story was about, not taking the American flag. This is what we were trying to focus on. Okay, we had all this media attention. Get the bullet points out. Get the, it's not about, you know, a Buddhist nun walking hundreds of miles to show up here and chant, you know. Right. It's what motivated her to come to the encampment because we're up against the... Yeah. the um, and they were playing the same game. I mean, they were not as skilled as they are now, but, you know, you'd open the paper. $360,000 spent on barbed wire fencing due to the encampment kind of stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, you didn't want that fence, you know? It's like, yeah. So they were playing it, too. Yeah. Um, they're playing it probably a little more sophisticated than we, but we were more sensational, so we got more coverage. But you got to know, I mean, we had women, you know, wearing polyester and had never probably seen a media person in their life being the spokespeople kind of stuff. And the, the media's going, who are these women? <laughs> <laughs> but, um... Women came up to us and said, I want to thank you. You know, I have been trying to get in the field and be an, uh, an investigative reporter, and I could not. And it was the encampment that, wow. that allowed that door to open by you all holding your ground and saying that, you know, we couldn't have access to the true behind-the-scenes story without it being women. We're given a shot. So, wow. I never thought of that. Yeah, that was yeah. really cool. Yeah. And then the other really cool thing, I mean, so many things are just great, but the other great thing was the march from Seneca to the camp when, you know, they were the stopped Waterloo. at Waterloo yeah. and, and arrested and everything. Not one woman, when people were taunting them, dirty lessies, da da da, I'll kill you, da, not one woman 
said, I'm not a lesbian. But as people came back to the encampment um, after court, and so many straight women said, we had no idea, you know. It was so uh -huh. eye-opening to have that kind of hatred focused at us. And all we had to do is say a few words, and that would have been different. And we, you know, stay true to our, our commitment, and we had no idea of what you all go through every day of your lives. And I think they're probably the strongest allies, you know, having been created that one day in terms okay. of so okay. many changes. So many changes. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I've seen women um, afraid to come there because of the, the, the lesbian tag, you know. Uh -huh. But when it first opened, okay, that lesbian tag hadn't taken route yet, you know. Yeah. It, it had been put out there a little bit, but everything was in motion. People were coming anyways. The lesbianism thing was not. It was the woman thing. Uh -huh. It was the uh, women taking the power and um, drawing the lines of uh, who could go where. Um, we had we had some people from the, one of the native tribes do a, an opening. I think she was Turtle Clan. And we had the um, the nod from AIM um, as being this is a good thing to support and uh, we just had the, the Buddhist colony, we had Dr. Spock and Bella Abzug show up. We, were, we had everybody, we had hundreds of thousands of people go there, we collected so much money, we had money, we paid off. That farm was totally 100% paid off and then after it all died down and all of this stuff is in place and we, you know, cut the fence a thousand times and they climbed up the water tower and, and wrote the famous stuff and, um, you know, rests every day and, and it was pretty interesting because we had ongoing civil disobedience trainings and that was War Resisters Lee, it was like a lot of different groups coming yeah. in to do those trainings. That's where I first met Mandy Carter. Even though Mandy and I were both from Albany, I'd never met her before. Uh. And so that was the first time that Mandy and I got together. Um, so they were doing trainings and then shoo, down to the fence, down to the <laughs> gate, they'd get arrested. It was like this ongoing uh, revolving door, you know. And you could only be arrested so many times before, you know, that kind of stuff, right? And. Uh, so I think a lot of, of um, activists were trained through the encampment. You know, a lot of women who then went in to be activists within the queer movement got their training in, in, um, at the encampment. And that's where um, I know later on when I went to, a, in 86, I went to a meeting in New York City because there was going to be a march on Washington. And this guy, John O'Brien from L.A., st stood up and said, Hey, you know what? Let's get the whole march and take a left and go over to the White House and storm it. And I was like in shock, you know. And I stood up and I said, uh, You can't do that. I mean, you know, civil disobedience is a whole process here. This is a, a consciousness raising. This is something you have to sit with and really examine what you're saying, where you're willing to go with it. And this is not a photo op, you know. This is kind of like, a, this is old time. The reason you want to be in the court is so that you can make a statement from your heart and have it recorded within our system. And not only that, you know, you have to think about your plants being watered, your cats being fed, your bond being paid, your job being lost. I mean, this is not, hey, let's take a left and go storm the White House. What's wrong with you? And so they say, oh, okay, Crone, will you do it? And then, you know, that's how I ended up organizing the um, civil disobedience at the Supreme Court against the Hardwood decision. But that was a lot of training ground for women. Well, the booklet that um, was created for Seneca is still to this day, I think, one of the, of the most comprehensive and, and just a wonderful document. And yeah. I put a few of these in the archives that I gave to the New York State uh, uh -huh. University there. Yeah. And in, nine, in um, 87, we used that booklet as the foundation for the booklet for all of the civil disobedience at the Supreme Court. Yeah. So. Cool. 
This is um, blinking, is that? I was thinking it's getting down on its tape. It's just letting me know we have a couple minutes left on this tape. So were you arrested? Did you do CD that summer? No. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, one of the drawbacks of being one of the most um, responsible for things in, in terms of how the, it operates is you have to keep it going. You have to keep it going. Yeah. So, you know, I was not able to go over the fence. I wasn't able to cut the fence. I wasn't, but I was able to like make sure that everything was in place for going over and cutting and getting out and all that was in place. Yeah. And was there discussion, I'm curious about a discussion in terms of nonviolence. When people originally imagined CD, was it going over the fence? Did the cutting, was that something that people talked about? Cutting or entering or painting? Well, you know, when you do the nonviolence, and you form your group. Your group comes up with what the what it's what they're going to do, what the action's going to do, following a theme. And our theme for being there was for educational purposes, for let letting them know that they don't have the power kind of at all times that they cannot dictate everything that gets done in a certain way that we wanted to disrupt that whole process and make them know that they weren't all powerful that they were vulnerable. And that's when the war started. I really do, I call it a war. Okay. Um, because, I mean, not only were they cutting our water lines, but one night, sitting in the office, hearing a thump next to my head on the wall, and going out and finding a hunting uh, arrow. That was that incident, uh -huh. okay. That had this metal jagged metal that if it had been six inches over it would have hit, hit our propane tank yeah it, and I you know that I yeah remember that. i mean i'll i'll never know really were they aiming for the tank were they really going to blow us up or were they scaring us i don't yeah. know yeah. it I was mean, dark with you know shots in front <clears> shots all the time and yeah. then we started to have to like form um our our own um, policing the outer areas, looking for men, because they were coming over. Yeah, that was a little bit later on. I mean, that wasn't in the beginning. No, not in but the beginning. We had security, and but it it wasn't. It it became a little bit more it escalated ugly later on. And you, you thought know? that was from the military more than townspeople, or a combination of both? Or I think it was a combination of both. I think it started with the military. I, I know it started with the military. Okay. Because we were told that they were the ones that came came over and started cutting our water lines. This is from Sha the the guy person from Sha. Yeah. yeah. And um, it yeah, it, it's kind of strange as the lesbianism thing grew more visible, more accusations were thrown at us. Uh, you know, we wanted to steal the kids. We wanted data, all right, of this right. kind the of women. stuff. <laughs> The women, women, yeah, and we were probably blamed for everything that ever happened in that county. You know, it was <laughs> our fault. But um, the longer it stuck out, the more that the authorities then I think came to respect, on some levels, what was happening there, because then women would be dropped off at the encampment right. by by the police. Right. Right. I mean, so much money was raised, and we never ever expected that much money was going to come through or that many people were going to come through, and we were very successful. I mean, we brought the attention to the, the uh, rural um, uh, military um, presence in our country. We um, started the educational process within the, the counties, even though they didn't want it. Uh, they needed to like face up to the fact that you know white animals and high cancer rates and being dependent on the military bases were were not really to their benefit. Um, we I think educated we gave a chance anyways for women young women to become educated to the possibilities of having other um, options open to them in life rather than the same um, patterns that, you know, 
they would normally have just fallen into. There were a lot of conversions of heterosexual into bisexual into lesbianism that I saw, but that always happens when women come together. There was a lot of um, development of women ritual, and this is important. I mean, it's yeah. not just um, it's not just that women were borrowing from the native traditions. They were, but Seneca created their own rituals and powerful rituals. And um, that continued to this day. I mean, Tell us a, a lot, well, circles forever. I mean, those beautiful paintings on the barn, you know, that, that all came from just blossoming of spirit and fire circles, affirmations, focusing energy. Yeah, we cut the fences and went in and painted, but we also circled before we went in. We envisioned what it was that we wanted to accomplish we um, shifted energy into making things happen. And this is not something that we thought maybe would work. We knew this to work. But I'm, where did you know that? Is it stuff you brought in? Did women bring in from other parts, other circles, other experiences? Yeah, but also we created, created it. created there. We created it. And it was a blending of, of different traditions, like a lot of uh, um, um, Buddhist, stuff a lot of I don't want to say Wicca it wasn't Wicca it was it was just lesbian kind of equivalent of doing that kind of magic with circles and focus and you know feathers rocks shells <laughs> drumming it was all happening there I and mean, people would come in and well we did this at Puget Sound you know and other people would come in and say well we want to do a peace encampment can we study with you all absolutely I mean, really, the outreach from this little place in upstate New York was tremendous, tremendous. I, I remember early, early on, I see this woman walking up our driveway carrying a guitar, wearing a green felt hat, and came to the door, and she said, can I stay here? I said, yeah, if you, you can stay here. She goes, do you need any help? I said, absolutely, here. Can you vacuum this room? And that was Mike. <laughs> and you know, Mike, who is now a minister, you know, uh -huh. continuing right. to do the peace work kind of stuff. Yeah. It just it keeps going. And Seneca was a training ground, and we did it all on our own in terms of women. We did it with women. I mean, men wanted to know how to help, and we were always saying, "Give us money, give us money. You have it, give it to us." But pretty much, it was all women's energy that created that space. What was it like you personally, just to be involved with something that, I mean, had you been involved in anything that successful that went like that? Or what was it just like personally being part of it? Well, I mean, I started out organizing in the late 60s. So right. in terms of organizing, it was, um, <laughs> it was like working in an ocean of chaos. Um, and because the decision making was so broad, that in organizing and decision making, you often need to be able to like make one fairly quickly in order to take, <laughs> make, take the next step. So that was challenging. And I have to say, you know, sometimes I just couldn't, I couldn't wait. I had to just do things. And then I would come back and like explain kind of stuff because you just, you know, you couldn't go and have a, a consensus about whether or not you should sign something in order to go to the next step. So, um, I, you know, you, it was creative because you're, myself, I had an eye on the goal of getting open legally <clears throat> so we wouldn't be closed down. I mean, at one point, like right before the opening, it was like, would they even allow the women on the land or were they going to just shift us all off, mm -hmm. you know? And then it was a lot of, and I do a lot of facilitation stuff, it was a lot of facilitating between major personality and, and belief systems clashing, you know. It took a lot of my energy, mm -hmm. a lot of it. But at that time, I mean, that's what I did, you know. And I learned that from working with women. I mean, I had a professional company facilitating in the later years, and I would go to the International Facilitation Association meetings, and I would go into a, um, a workshop on chaos, and you would have to identify 
uh, where you are in, on the line of, of work, being able to work in chaos, one through ten. <laughs> and I would take the chalk and I'd go over, you know, to like, I'd create 30. And they'd go, what are you talking about? And I would give them an example, you know, <laughs> of like from the camming or from the P or from the, the festivals. I mean, I just, you know, all my life I've been in the midst of, of the, you know, chaotic kind of craziness that we create when we're moving along. So it was a great training ground for me too and it was wonderful people and I'm really glad that, uh, I mean, I got Louise to do her dissertation on that because I wanted to legitimize within the academic world mm -hmm. the encampment because I knew the importance of, of what was happening there and didn't want it to just be isolated as some crazy little thing. You know, I really... Yeah, from the festivals. I mean, when we were doing Michigan, we would get seven, at that time, seven, eight thousand people in right. there. And it was very similar in terms of different classes and different um, identifications, uh -huh. um, having to, like, you know, sh live in that small village. And because I created the rumor control and the political right, tent, right. having to be the front line stuff then yeah I was I personally was able to have some historical reference points right. that you know this is not out of control this is totally to be expected right. okay. well I mean that kind of stuff was not only validated at the encampment but really encouraged you know yeah. there, there wasn't we didn't bring the baggage from the mainstream in that, that only nutty people like would rely upon psychic kind of connections, we really tried to reverse that way of thinking in terms of validating it and trying to like get rid of the garbage and the channels that prevented that stuff from happening. It was like a whole new brave, <coughs> excuse me, world that incorporated a lot of the historical. Women were trying to bring in what other strong women had done in the past with the native connection and the the um, peace Perfect. activists connection and, and all of that. And what you're doing now is really important because it really has kind of like um, become more difficult to organize in this environment of, of you know, the, the Bush administration taking away all the civil liberties to even question. And I would say to you when you collect your data, if you can bring in some like social anthropologists to do the analytical yeah. stuff and looking at it from a lot of different levels around social change and women's empowerment and uh -huh. uh, challenging the um, you know the powers that be, yeah. um, because this is the kind of stuff that needs to go back into the world of academia. I really believe women need to study this in women's studies classes, in race and gender classes, in all of that uh -huh. and that's again something that uh, you know um, um, what's her name why am I spacing on her name Krasowitz Louise. Louise Louise that Louise can maybe help with but I think it's so important that we attach to other ways of looking at things so that we become incorporated into the history herstory mm -hmm. because they will try to push us out mm -hmm. and there's just so much that went on there so much that continues because that there was there you know I mean I remember one time I was asked to speak at the now the national now conference and I spoke only about the the uh, festivals and those women didn't get it <laughs> they just didn't get it you know, but it was all about women being empowered and challenging the powers that have control. And, uh -huh. and at the encampment, that's all we did. You know, no, we're going to build this pole barn ourselves. How are women going to build a pole barn? Oh, well, you watch us. And they we did. They came out in trucks, lined up along the side of the road. We were doing the pole, you know, that elect the uh, pa gas-powered pole thing that would throw women off. They'd start to do it and what? There goes another woman, you know. <laughs> And you could see the guys in the trucks kind of chuckling and, and another woman would go in there. I, I mean, Samoa really was the best. I mean, she could hang on and just go down, down, down. But and then women would shout, well, I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. I don't know how to do it. Well, here, you put your hand here, you put your hand, you know, and three months later, 
you see that same woman with a tool belt, you know, going out into the back to repair something or to build something on the kitchen. And it was just an amazing, amazing learning experience and opening experience, opening to, to people's, yeah. to women's, um, you know, potential. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we had several hundred thousands of dollars come through the encampment that summer. And when the Labor Day came, many of us just assumed that we would just keep going and we would shift a little bit, of course, but there was a group of women who said, look, I was a part of the fundraising, you know, I believed in the vision, we have to stay true to our commitment which was to go through Labor Day and so well we don't want to well we have to so the compromise was we would take all the money that we raised ask for proposals that went along the lines of what our whole vision was for the encampment <clears throat> and then we would give the money out I think we kept a little bit of money for tax purposes but not enough certainly not enough and um, so we did we looked at things and I'm sure there has to be records of who received the money and uh, you know there's some pretty creative proposals that came in from women and, and I think they had to have a connection to the encampment you know the the idea maybe was born at the encampment or somebody came and felt empowered from the encampment and want to go back to this community and open up a, some kind of women's resource center, you know, along those lines. And I'm sure that that documentation must exist somewhere. Where are the